Well, we've been clear in terms of the, the permanent program to reduce that to 140,000. The traditional mix of that program has been about two-thirds skilled, one-third unskilled. But we would look at the demand settings at the time. Uh, we have said that we want a priority for people involved in the construction industry uh, to be brought in because we've got building approvals at an 11-year low, as Michael pointed out before. And why the Prime Minister is bringing in a million people when you're only building 250,000 homes, and the problem compounds each year, uh, it's, I, I just think it's a Prime Minister who is out of his depth uh, and doesn't have the strength or the capacity to make the decisions in our country's best interests. And with your um, policy, though, on, um, on net migration, I mean, how, how can you guarantee that it won't have an adverse effect on people coming in from the UK? Well, I... I well, uh, a couple of points. Uh, first is uh, I worked very closely with Peter Costello when he was Treasurer. I was Assistant Treasurer. Uh, we've cleaned up Labor messes before and we can do it again. Uh, as Migration Minister, I worked uh, in a way that kept our borders secure and our migration program properly managed. Uh, these problems around housing and the rental accommodation crisis that we've got at the moment, all of Labor's making. When you look at the numbers that ramped up dramatically and every time they make a prediction, about numbers coming down in the migration program, they always go up uh, because Labor can't make the decisions necessary uh, because they're trying to please a domestic audience or see political gain in it otherwise. Uh, the net overseas migration obviously is a product of people coming in uh, and leaving uh, and we have the settings in place, we've outlined them. They create 40,000 or free up 40,000 homes in the first year, but just over 100,000 homes over five years and had the Prime Minister introduced this policy from day one instead of his reckless, unplanned Big Australia policy, it would be about 325,000 more homes that are freed up for Australians to be living in today. And we wouldn't see the tragedy of people having to live rough and in cars and tents and uh, couch surfing and staying at home for longer when really they want to leave home and go out and buy a home. Well, we, we've been very clear uh, that you have to have a policy where you've got cheaper electricity, you've got consistent electricity so that we don't have blackouts and brownouts because otherwise manufacturing will just go offshore where they can get a reliable energy source. And we want, want to make sure that we've got cleaner energy. Uh, they're the three requirements for us. Uh, now, a, as we've said, as you transition over the next decade or so, about 90% of firming capacity goes from the market. That is 90% of 24-7 power goes out of the grid. And that's why you've got Labor governments now who are negotiating for extension of life for coal-fired power station assets. Uh, and let, let, let's cut through Labor's rhetoric and trying to please the Greens and the Teals and everyone else. Labor at the moment is negotiating and paying the owners of coal-fired power stations to extend the life of those so that the lights don't go out. Uh, there is a huge need for gas into the system so that you can provide for peaking and you can bring prices down and have stability. Uh, Labor talks a big game in relation to gas and then they go out and fund the Environmental Defender's Office, uh, which is all about stopping the projects from going ahead. And that's why the energy regulator has warned this government time over that if they continue to sleepwalk toward this energy crisis, power bills will keep going up, lights will go out and we won't get the transition to greener energy that we need. And the Prime Minister can pretend that the solar panels will work of a night time or the wind turbines will spin 24 hours a day. It doesn't happen. You need to be able to firm up the energy. And that's why, if you look at the top 20 economies in the world, Australia is the only one at the moment that hasn't got nuclear power or hasn't signed up to it. It's cheaper, it's more reliable, it's zero emissions, which is why 65% of people aged between 18 and 34 support nuclear. It's why there's a huge debate in the UK at the moment where Labor is criticising the Tory government there for not having enough nuclear in the system to firm up. Uh, and why do we think somehow that the G19 have got it terribly wrong and Anthony Albanese and Chris Bowen have got it right? I mean, it just doesn't add up. 